Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, I came to the conclusion some time ago that it takes me about 10 years to forget what a pain in the neck <laughs> writing a book is. And then I, I uh, make the mistake of starting to write another one. And so right on schedule, here's uh, my newest book. Uh, I was uh, encouraged to write it by the fact that I it became very clear to me in blogging about the Fed's operating system and how it changed during the crisis that the vast majority of people, including, I'm afraid, a lot of Fed officials, had no idea what they'd done uh, uh, or what effects it was, what consequences it was having. So I wrote this book to tell that story and to talk about those consequences and to explain why I think it's extremely important that while they're normalizing monetary policy, Federal Reserve officials uh, are encouraged to get back to what now in retrospect seems like a more normal operating system and one that, that uh, for all the problems uh, that the Fed has had before the crisis, was still a bigger, a, b a better, more reliable operating system than, uh, than what they've created since. Our story begins uh, not at the very beginning of the story of the Great Recession, but in the summer of 2008. Now, we know in retrospect, thanks to the grand poopas at the NBER, that the recession had already started some months before then, in December 2007. But in the summer of 2008, nobody knew that we were in a recession, let alone that we were about to be in a, uh, a Great Recession. Instead, the principal preoccupation of the Fed throughout that summer was inflation. The inflation rate, the headline inflation rate, had risen well above what was already an implicit 2% inflation target. And even though core inflation, uh, which is excluding oil and other things, was relatively stable, and and the PCE inflation rate, which is really what the Fed's supposed to look at, was also flat. Nevertheless, the concern was that monetary policy might be getting too loose. Now, this, this increase in prices, I should mention, was driven almost entirely by a spike in the price of oil. It was a classic example of a supply-driven increase in prices, that is, it wasn't that there was too much money being created, it was that there was too little oil to be bought with it. And, uh, and uh, these supply uh, produced s s movements in the price level are relatively common and they add a lot of amplitude uh, to what the inflation rate would look like in their absence. Nevertheless, uh, Fed the f officials on the FOMC were determined that monetary policy should uh, be, remain tight, or at least not loosen anymore. That's what was the consensus view. So they wanted, in order not to get the inflation rate, uh, to keep some limit on inflation. The problem was <coughs> that at this time, oops, let's see if we, okay. Uh, now, if you were not looking at prices, but you were looking at the behavior of spending and real GDP, you would see that, in fact, things were heading downhill. They weren't heading that way precipitously yet, but in retrospect, we know that this was the beginning, this period of the summer of 2008, was actually the, the beginning of the more uh, severe recession that we're all familiar with now. I'll come back to this chart in a minute. The problem Fed officials faced, given their desire not to ease monetary policy, was that the Fed already was engaging in rather substantial emergency lending at this time. That lending wasn't aimed at creating more money or more liquidity for the economy in general. It wasn't intended to be a, a, a means for loosening monetary policy. It was intended to shore up the balance sheets of various financial institutions, banks and investment banks that were seen to be in hot water at the time. But the Fed did not want the money creation 
or the credit creation that it was engaged in in order to shore up the certain banks or certain elements of the monetary system, it didn't want that to translate into more bank reserves for the system as a whole and to a corresponding general liquidity creation. So up until October 2008, what the Fed was doing, as you can see from this chart, was uh, getting rid of treasury securities to make up for the loans it was making. So it's increasing the item loans in its portfolio, loans to troubled financial institutions. Those are going up, but it offsets that with a corresponding amount of sales of tre treasury securities. And therefore, the overall supply of uh, the overall quantity of Federal Reserve assets which will be reflected in the quantity of reserves and the quantity of high-powered money, is essentially kept flat. So this is how the Fed is expanding uh, its lending without expanding the monetary base. The problem is that by the time, by uh, October, right, several things have happened. One is that the amount of Federal Reserve emergency lending Ratchets, it up, ratchets up tremendously with the consequences of Lehman's failure. That was one institution to which they were not willing to make uh, substantial emergency loans. Uh, the Fed then followed that by essentially ratcheting up its emergency lending to AIG and to other institutions. So its balance, its credits are growing more rapidly than ever. On the other hand, its treasury portfolio by then has gotten so small that it cannot successfully sterilize that level of emergency lending. In other words, it can no longer keep its total balance sheet from growing, which we see it starting to do here. Note that there's no official quantitative easing yet in the, this little stretch of time. That'll only start in December. About here, we'll start having it, some changes. But there's no real quantitative easing. So what can the Fed do in order to keep monetary policy tight under these circumstances? Well, its balance sheet is growing, oh, by the way, so it, and it can't sterilize. It does a couple things. The less important one for our purposes is shown here. This is a new program allowing the Treasury to park more money than usual in the Fed, which withdraws it from the banking system and is a way of essentially helping to sterilize some of the, this growth in the Fed's balance sheet. That program lasts for a little while, then it tapers down, and in the rest of our story it doesn't matter because the Fed comes up with another solution for keeping a lid on credit creation and fighting inflation, which is what they're still determined to do. And that solution is to pay interest on banks' reserve balances so that the banks Though they do receive additional reserves because of this, not fully offset by that or this, the, although they receive additional reserves, the idea is to make reserves attractive enough for the banks to hang on to rather than to use as a basis for acquiring other assets, other interest earning assets. That is, the policy is to pay interest on reserves so that reserves no longer have what economists call the opportunity cost associated with them that they normally would have if they were non-interest earning assets. And here we can see a chart showing what this translates to in terms of the, uh, 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 the federal funds rate and the interest on excess reserves. So this line here shows the gyrations of the interest rate on reserves which for a time is actually set rather high and finally settles down at 25 basis points. What matters is not the absolute level of the interest rate paid on reserves, but how that rate compares to other market rates, as we'll see. Uh, now, the Fed's original goal was to keep the federal funds rate, which is what it regards as symbolizing the stance of monetary policy, uh, from changing from its desired target. When the interest on excess reserves policy was introduced, in fact at the same time, 
the Fed adjusted its federal funds rate target from 2%, where it had tried to hold it for many months, to 1.5%, where it now hoped it could keep it. Let me explain to those who are, of you who may not be familiar that the federal funds market is the market for bank reserves, reserve balances at the Fed. Normally, it consists of, uh, it, it, the activity there consists of exchanges between banks that are a little bit short of reserves and banks that have surplus reserves, and they trade on the federal funds market. The effective federal funds rate, which is the light blue line, is the actual rate prevailing in that market. And ordinarily, the idea is that the Fed's target policy rate and that rate should be the same. As you can see, ultimately, the Fed failed to keep the federal funds rate at 1.5% or even close to that. It couldn't even keep it ultimately at 0.25% or 25 uh, basis points. Uh, so its efforts to maintain its, the stance of monetary policy using interest on excess reserves failed. But that didn't mean that interest on excess reserves didn't work in the sense of sequestering reserves uh, in the banking system to keep them from contributing to overall monetary expansion and monetary stimulus. By the way, I meant to mention, if you want to interrupt me with a question, you're, even though this is the keynote speech, please feel free. I've certainly interrupted lots of you in the course of the last couple days, and I don't want to have special rules apply. So if, uh, particularly if, you confuse, if I confuse you, let me know. I should say that the statute that enabled the Fed to pay interest on reserves was actually part of a 2006 law, the Financial Services Regulatory, Regulatory Relief Act. And at that time, the point of the measure had nothing to do with changing the Fed's operating system. It was designed to give some relief to banks to the extent that they were required to hold some reserves, some percentage of reserves against their deposits. Those reserves traditionally bore no interest. The idea was to let them earn some interest so that our banks wouldn't be taxed relative to many foreign banks that had no reserve requirements to meet at all. Uh, but the law at the time specified that uh, the interest paid on reserves was to be, the significant part is the last part here, paid at a rate or rates not to exceed the general level of short-term interest rates. Now that's very important because you can see how this is consistent with making reserve holding less onerous but not making it so attractive that it's more attractive than holding other interest earning assets whether they're securities or loans. That measure, that stipulation remained in effect when in 2008 the law's application was advanced so that it could come into effect several years ahead of in original, the originally scheduled time. This law, this act, would have allowed the Fed to pay interest on reserves in 2011. The uh, subsequent emergency legislation it moved the date forward to October 2008. But what's significant is that the language of the law didn't change, but what the Fed intended to do and how it had to twist the law did change because to sequester reserves, to use interest on reserves as a way of keeping money tight, the Fed had to pay in interest rates on reserves that were actually attractive relative to other rates. And here we can see uh, what that meant in practice. Uh, IOER here is the interest rate in excess reserves, right? And uh, that's the dotted line. This chart shows uh, the period after it had fallen or been reduced to 25 basis points. These other rates are respectively the rate on the overnight, uh, the overnight uh, London rate. It's the London interbank overnight rate. Uh, so that shouldn't say overnight LIBOR. It is the LIBOR. Uh, and the effective federal funds rate. You can see that the LIBOR, which is not itself directly influenced by this uh, IOER, it's an independent rate. It, too, is consistently below the IOER rate. Um, and uh, we can go further than that to show just what it, the extent to which this interest on excess reserve rates appears to be higher than general short-term market rates if we look at the rates on Treasury securities. And again, you can see that uh, 
these are securities, these different lines show treasuries of different mature, or different uh, uh, duration. And uh, the four weeks are darker blue, way down here. These are one year treasuries, even one year treasuries have lower yields than 25 basis points for much of the period in question. In fact, if a bank for most of this period wanted to earn more on treasury securities than on reserves, it had to go out at least to a two-year maturity. Now, th that's important because longer-term securities naturally tend to pay higher interest rate than shorter-term maturities because they involve greater duration risk. Reserves are essentially overnight uh, assets. So if we're making reasonable comparisons across different short-term rates, one of which is the interest rate on excess reserves, we certainly wouldn't, we certainly would have to say that if that interest rate is higher than two-year or th uh, uh, than one-year treasuries, higher than everything except two-year treasuries, and sometimes higher even uh, uh, than that, then uh, that seems like it's an interest rate that does exceed the general level of short-term interest rates. So you might ask, before we go on and talk about the consequences of all this, macroeconomic and otherwise, how did the Fed get away with this given what the law says? Well, there's this wonderful doctrine that says that when these legislation is passed, the institutions to which the legislation applies, the government agencies and otherwise, get to write their own uh, detailed regulation concerning how they're going to interpret the law. So the Fed did that in something called Regulation Q, which I'm sure it had a bunch of lawyers and economists working on for some time, and they came up with this. The relevant part of it uh, is the bottom part. For purposes of applying the law, short-term interest rates, they decided, are rates on obligations with maturities of no more than one year, which is, of course, a term uh, much longer than that on reserves, such as the primary credit rate rates on term federal funds, term repurchase agreements, commercial paper term, euro dollars, etc. Notice how they specify term. Now why? You've got an overnight rate, why not compare it to other overnight rates? If that's the idea is that it shouldn't be higher than comparable rates, which is a reasonable interpretation of the law. The comparable rates here would not be the term rates, it'd be the overnight rates, or the, right? But the most offensive thing about this is the inclusion of the primary credit rate. Does anyone know what the common name for that rate is? Ta uh, Walker. I, I used to be their lawyer for 20 years. It's the discount rate. Yes. Now, the interesting thing about the discount rate is that for some time now, it has been a matter of deliberate Fed policy to, quote, set it at a level exceeding the level of short-term market rates. So they can meet the requirement that the interest rate on excess reserves not exceed the level of short-term market rates by setting it below a rate that always ex exceeds the level of short-term market rates. Got it? Moreover, the, the uh, primary credit rate is always set by a specific margin above the federal funds rate, which is to say also above the federal funds rate target so long as the actual rate isn't exceeding its target. Here, the actual rate's always below the target. The target is IOER. The primary rate is, by, def by policy, 50, 50 basis points above IOER. So it's impossible, in other words, the Fed can do anything it wants to with the IOER rate and it'll be meeting the requirements of the law as interpreted by Regulation D, which the Federal Reserve wrote. Do you like that? Lovely, isn't it? Sometimes I'd like to be a central bank. <laughs> now, let's talk about some of the consequences of this new regime. And, and believe me, they're quite uh, sweeping consequences. The most obvious consequence, and, and an intended consequence, was that lending on the federal funds market collapses, right? Banks used to lend on the federal funds market, first of all, because some banks had reserves they were willing to part with, and second, because some banks had uh, not enough reserves. All of that changes, first, because interest on reserves makes banks unwilling to part with reserves for anything that's less than the rate of interest on reserves, 
but just as importantly, the growth in the quantity of absol absolute quantity of reserves, which we'll look at more closely later, means that banks, there aren't many banks around that are sh ever short of reserves. So the Fed funds market, which used to be a market where the majority of trades, practically all trades, are trades among banks, genuine interbank tra trades where there's heterogeneity of some banks short, some banks have surplus reserves. It doesn't, it, it doesn't cease to function at all, but the activity drops down dramatically, as you can see, but more importantly, the participants change. And the reason, and what's going on now is, the activity on this market no longer is interbank. There are some institutions, mainly the uh, uh, federal home loan banks, that's this part of the volume. Those institutions have federal funds, that is, they keep balances at the Fed. They're allowed to have a deposit there. But they were not eligible for interest on reserves. Therefore, if they wanted a piece of the action, they'd have to deal with the banks earning interest on reserves. If they had excess reserves, they would lend to the banks that could earn the interest for a share of the interest. That is why the two things happen on the interbank market or on the federal funds market. One is the volume goes way down because there's no interbank activity, but it doesn't dry up because there is bank to non-bank arbitrage activity. And the other thing that happens, of course, is all the arbitrage is that rates below the IOER rate. So the IOER rate doesn't define the effective federal funds rate. It ends up being always above it, which was a disappointment to Fed officials because they wanted to use it as a way to set an immediate target. So the Fed is, no law, is not able to do what it would normally do in an orthodox floor system. It would set an IOER rate. No trading would happen in the interbank or in the Fed funds market. The IOER rate and the effective federal funds rate would look the same, but that's only because there'd be no trading. Uh, instead, because of the presence of the GSEs, you have a leaky floor system, and the, there is an observable fluctuating federal funds rate, and it's always below what should have been the floor. So when we say this is a floor system, you have to understand it's a leaky floor system, so the floor isn't really the floor for the federal funds rate as it would be if there were no GSEs. Got that? Okay. Oh. George, go back a moment. Yeah. Uh, no, right side, uh, forward one. Okay. Okay, out there around 2015, 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. Surely that is a mistake that the interbank loan rate is well below zero. You don't mean they had negative rates in that era, mm -hmm. do you? And I'll be careful that this chart refers to a different, uh, um, a, a, the differential. Yeah. Okay. So this is the spread. spread. Gotcha. That's the spread, and that's the volume. And what we're showing here is how uh, it's precisely as the spread between the interbank rate, in this case the LIBOR, and the interest rate and excess reserves decline, the volume of uh, trades decline, the volume of activity declines. I assume, sorry, I assume you're getting to this too, but I understand why there's, uh, the Fed funds rate is below the IOER. What about the, the treasuries and the other short-term bills? I assume there's some regulatory reason. Are you getting No, that? no. Market rates are generally collapsing. Market interest rates are generally collapsing because of the crisis, because of uncertainty, and, uh, uh, and uh, because underlying natural rates are falling. For all sorts of reasons, rates are low. And this is, of course, what happens in a tight money environment. Despite the high inflation numbers that summer, this was a world in which uh, this was a world going into a recession. And in a recession, demand generally is collapsing. Let's go back to this uh, very fundamental chart here, which I'm going to use more than once. In a recession, spending is collapsing. That's the dark blue line. And as it's collapsing, it's tending to drag down real production with it. And you can see that very clearly here. But that decline in spending is a decline in, uh, 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 is a decline in demand across many markets, including the markets for borrowing. So there are fewer people who want to borrow, uh, and uh, that's going to depress the equilibrium lending rates. 
So those rates were going down. The Fed was trying to keep its policy too high relative to what the market was uh, calling for, using interest on reserves to prop rates up. But the result of that is a failed experiment where, in fact, other rates end up being well below its rate. And indeed, how are you going to prop other rates up except by trying to administer a rate that's higher than they are? I, I guess the, the mystery to me still is in the Treasury. Why would uh, anybody hold a 0.01 percent Treasury when you can get an excess reserve at 0.25? Remember, most of us can't have that 0.25. Only banks, even the GSEs, had to settle for less, right? If you're lucky enough to be a, this is a, this is the perverse world we're in, where if you're lucky enough to be a bank, you can get 25 basis points free and clear. The rest of us have to settle for lower rates because we don't have the privilege of access to the interest rate on excess reserves, which is confined to a s small subset of depository institutions. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I, I would. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to answer that. Oh, definitely answer that. Yeah. I don't have an answer. Uh, securities firms, for example, if I hold treasury, would find that they want to lend them out overnight also. And because of the federal home loan banks selling Fed funds and other factors, they would find that on any given night, for a one month or three month treasury, you cannot get anywhere close to the federal funds rate. Did that situation prevailed for probably three or four years. Yeah. yeah. Did you? Yeah. So, I mean, shortly after the crisis, there was a virtual orgy of secondary transactions in the market. MBS, uh, private credit, private equity, hedge funds, etc. Very, very deep discounts. Yeah. A lot of the sellers were banks. Right. And to what extent is the excess reserve policy just essentially masking impairments? I'm going to get to that. Okay. I think it might be the next slide. Uh, but before I do, I uh, wanted to show that, um, uh, let's, uh, let's go back. Before I do that, let me get to the, um, let me get back to talking about how this new system is going to operate for monetary policy, how it changes the game of determining monetary policy, and particularly how it changes the consequence of the Fed's creating more reserves. And I will come to that specific point in a few slides. When I get back to talking a little bit more about what happened in the interbank market, I will, I will uh, get to precisely the point about all the panic that's breaking out, which is essentially what you're asking about, right? Yeah. So, in a conventional system, and I'm repeating some of what Tom ha Thomas Hogan uh, told you the other day, but it never hurts to learn things more than once, um, you have a situation where there's a demand for federal funds and the Fed sets a target rate. And, and uh, given that downward sloping schedule of demand for banks for uh, uh, funds. And here we should think of the demand for funds as a demand to borrow reserves from other banks, right? Uh, if the Fed sets a target, it's, the way it achieved the target was by changing the supply of, of balances, which it did by expanding or contracting its balance sheet, usually through open market operations, which are purchases and sales of treasury securities, usually short term. Treasury bills, the Fed buys Treasury bills, it pays for them essentially with fresh reserves, those go into the banking system, that schedule moves out to the right, and the, the uh, equilibrium or market clearing Fed funds rate goes down, and, uh, 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 and, and, and it, that's fine if the target has been lowered, and vice versa for sale. Anyway, there's a close connection between the size of the Fed's balance sheet or the quantity of reserves it creates, you can think of those as being roughly the same thing, and where the interest rate in the federal funds market that uh, represents the Fed's desired or uh, policy stance is. In the new system, the interest rate on reserves exceeds rates on other assets, so once uh, and the supply of balances is assumed to be at a point where you're at that part of the demand schedule that's horizontal, and never mind this little thing here, it's flat. I've redrawn these in the book versions that will be published. So at that point, the supply of balances can be increased, reduced, it makes no difference for the prevailing federal funds rate, and 
what you end up with is a system where the Fed can set the stance of policy defined as the, the target rate, which is really now the IOER rate, wherever it wants to, and it can change its balance sheet, making it bigger or smaller, and thereby changing bank reserve holdings in any way it wants to. But those are completely unrelated or independent policy choices. The fans of the system, I have to tell you this because you're going to want to know why people thought that this might be a good change, right? The fans of the system say, look, we have a wonderful setup where now we can make banks as liquid as we want and it doesn't interfere with our monetary policy stance, which is solely a function of where we put the interest rate on excess reserves. You got that? So we have two controls that used to be linked. So you, you couldn't manipulate them independently. Now we can divorce the stance of monetary policy set by the interest rate on reserves from liquidity policy, as it were, which is a function of the size of our balance sheet. Right? That's the argument. Now I'm going to make an analogy and later we'll see how this analogy uh, helps to account for some subsequent developments. Suppose I have an automobile and I have the following complaint. There are two controls in the automobile. A steering wheel, which determines the direction, and a gas pedal, which determines the, the, the uh, speed. And the problem is, don't you know, certain combinations of hitting the gas and turning the steering wheel just aren't practically possible with the usual transmission mechanism that's in place, the transmission of the car. But we can fix that. How can we fix it? Put it in neutral. You put the car in neutral, now you can independently set the steering any direction you want. Turn the wheels as hard as you want, right, left, it's fine and you can step on the gas as hard as you want. But there is a problem with this new wonderful system with two completely independent control variables. What is it? What's that? You don't go anywhere. We're going to see how monetary policy now no longer goes anywhere in important respects. Someone's shaking his head so I know he understands exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> I hope he's shaking his head at the Fed, not at me. So, remember that this all gets started because the Fed is incidentally creating new reserves and it doesn't want that to loosen monetary policy unintentionally. That's because they were still worrying about oil price driven inflation. By, by late November 2008, that is a month and a half or so after instituting this new policy, the economy is looking really bad. And they're all saying, you know, maybe we need a little monetary stimulus after all. So they decide now they're going to expand the Fed's balance sheet and create reserves on purpose. And that is what quantitative easing will be. An intentional expansion of the balance sheet designed to increase bank reserves and provide for loosening of policy. Well, they didn't put it that way, of course, because they couldn't loosen policy under the floor system just by expanding the balance sheet. But they come up with new theories of how this uh, increase in balances would uh, somehow matter. Now, so the problem, of course, as you've all realized, I think, is that they still have a setup in place that's designed to sequester any new reserves created so that they don't get used by banks to expand lending and ultimately depend, uh, expand deposits in the system. So they have the same mechanism in place that was once meant to prevent emergency expansion from stimulating the economy and they're going to keep it in place now that they want intentional expansions to stimulate the economy. I testified to Congress about the floor system, I think it's been two years now, almost two years exactly because it was in July, and referring to this development I said, well, you know, if insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result, one has to wonder whether Fed officials at this time were in their right minds. And in fact, of course, what happened is, despite now really dramatic growth in the quantity of reserves, well, in the size of the Fed's balance sheet, which is this upper line, or the monetary base, 
right? It's growing gangbusters through several rounds of quantitative easing, not all of which are shown in this picture. Excess reserves just pile up almost in lockstep with the growth in the balance sheet. That is, the reserves get to the banks and stay there. Nothing else happens with them. Instead of the usual process where confronted with reserves that have a positive opportunity cost and having a desire not to incur more of such a cost than necessary, banks would dispose of the reserves. At first they would place them on the Fed funds market if any other banks were willing to have them, but in the long run they'd adjust their lending and, uh, and other and securities purchases uh, in order to uh, end up with a low, very low minimal holdings of excess reserves and more other of, of holdings of other higher interest earning assets. But that didn't happen here because reserves were the more attractive assets in the economy. Now just to drive home the point, uh, it is not the case and here's where some Federal Reserve economists have really been misleading. A lot of some Fed economists have said, look, the Fed was expanding, the reserves have to go somewhere, so it, it's bound to be the case that reserves go up as the Fed's balance sheet grows. That's got nothing to do with interest on reserves. But hold on. It's not total reserves going up that's a result of interest on excess reserves. This quantity of total reserves will go up if the Fed creates more reserves, and that's that. Banks can pass them around, they can't get rid of them. But excess reserves, banks can get rid of. They don't get rid of them in the sense that they get destroyed when banks lend them away. The reserves do still get passed around. But what happens as a result of this hot potato business where every bank gets rid of reserves it doesn't want and some other bank ends up with them is that through various rounds of elimination of unwanted reserves, the quantity of bank deposits grows in the system and you end up with so many deposits that eventually your excess reserve ratio is right back down and, uh, to, to where you wanted, your excess reserves, sorry, are back down to that minimum level. And here you can see how this worked in the days before the Fed, I mean before interest on excess reserves. Here's what's happening to excess reserves, right? And here you can see how no matter what the quantity of excess reserve, uh, uh, sorry, total reserves is, Right, the quantity of total reserve balances here is fluctuating with the Fed's activity. Uh, and it's, uh, it's sometimes going down, and that's because of changes in reserve management that will actually allow the Fed to reduce the supply of reserves in or, and make it necessary for it to do so to keep uh, tabs on inflation and so on. But excess reserves are always at very low levels. How is that possible? Why aren't these moving together? Because as this is growing here, for example, banks are expanding deposits just as much so that the excess is, is still trivial. Does that make sense to everybody? Ex required reserves are going up as deposits go up because they're a percentage, fixed, roughly fixed percentage of deposits. And by the way, and this is another argument I've had with some Fed economists, they, they, I, I wrote and said, look, that you've got it wrong. There's a distinction between the determinants of excess reserves and the determinants of reserves. So it's not the same. Banks can, in principle, always have low excess reserves by creating enough deposits. His response was, well, when the magnitude of deposit crea creation is such as it was under QE with the three rounds, then it's no longer possible for banks to make that many loans. There's not enough loan possibilities out there. And I wrote him back and said, well, excuse me, but in the German hyperinflation, the order of magnitude of increase of, of bank reserves was many times greater than in QE, as fantastic as QE was. Yet, not only did the German banks expand deposits e even more rapidly, or uh, the, uh, uh, as rapidly res uh, as reserves and keep the same low ratio reserves, they actually lowered their reserve ratios. They created more deposits. They're always able to get rid of non-interest earning reserves as long as there are other assets that earn more interest. He didn't have an answer to that. <coughs> Here it comes, this, now we're coming back to the question of panic. It's possible that banks are accumulating reserves or not, and not lending in the interbank market because of panic, right? You don't trust your counterparties, you're seeing failures left and right. Uh, you want to have plenty of reserves in case you're faced with a run. 
we have fortunately a pretty reliable measure of the, if, if as it were, extent of panic in the market, and it's the so-called TED spread. And it's a, sp it's a spread between uh, uh, tre treasuries and other riskier assets. And you see that TED spread, sp spread spike after layman's, just when you would expect. And to the extent that it's doing so, that could explain a decline in interbank lending and accumulation of excess reserves that has nothing to do with the fact that reserves are now paying a little more interest than they used to. However, the TED spread very quickly recovers in the subsequent uh, months. And, but though it falls, you can see that here I'm just showing excess reserves. Excess reserves continue to grow in lockstep with the federal funds reserve creation and would do so for many years going out when it's no longer plausible at all to appeal to panic. And the same is true for the interbank activity. It goes down and it stays down and it's down today. So panic does contribute to the story temporarily, but it can't tell the long run story of what's, of what's happening to excess reserve accumulation, to interbank lending. To explain those things, the best explanation is the straightforward one. Banks now found it, found it more attractive to hold reserves, excess reserves, than they used to because they earn interest, and that includes more attractive than lending on the interbank market. Does that, does that address that? Uh, one of the things that's uh, not so well known is that the accumulation of excess reserves is not evenly distributed among all banks. Particularly, two groups of banks are hoarding most of the reserves that the Fed is creating at this time. They are the very largest banks, which tend to be in New York. You could, you could look at the bank holding companies for uh, an index of this. The Fed data doesn't nicely break things off by very large banks and large banks. But uh, here what I do is I look at banks with more than $15 billion of worth of assets, that's actually not a good measure. The banks that were holding most of the uh, uh, reserves in, that were U.S. banks were the much larger than 15 billion. And the other group of banks is, uh, uh, and here you see the large banks versus smaller banks. Here you see foreign and domestic, and you can see the very large share of excess reserves held by foreign banks. These are banks that ha are foreign bank branches in the United States. And one reason, there are two reasons why they find hoarding reserves especially attractive. One is that interest rates, they don't make, these banks aren't, aren't uh, engaging in retail lending. They don't take deposits. They don't make retail loans in the United States. They make them in, their parent companies make them in Europe. And interest rates are generally even lower in Europe than they are in the United States, making excess reserve holdings in the U.S. more attractive for that reason. Second, they're exempt from FDIC charges because they don't have any retail deposits, they don't have deposit insurance. Other U.S. banks have to pay FDIC premiums that from 2011 onward are proportional to their total assets, reserves included. So interest on reserves, on excess reserves, is more attractive to foreign banks or very, especially attractive to foreign banks because of those two considerations and we can understand. But again, this is all assuming that interest on in reserves is part of the story, right? So if, if, if not, well, okay, I welcome other explanations of why foreign banks are holding so many reserves that doesn't depend on and reserves being an interest on reserve being a crucial determinant of hoarding. Uh, this, these charts show that uh, even though banks were inclined to hoard a lot of reserves, it didn't mean that they were indifferent to fluctuations in market rates. And what it's showing here is the, the spread between the LIBOR and the IOER rate and cash as a share of total bank assets. And as you can see, uh, cash is very high as we saw before, but it's still responding. When interest rates on the LIBOR, when the LIBOR rate goes up and the IOER rate is fixed, as it is for most of this period, uh, then banks hold fewer res excess reserves. The demand goes somewhat down, but when it goes down, the opposite happens. Very nice, very high correlation. Now I want to talk about the effect all this had on bank lending, because that's very important. As I'm sure most of you know, bank lending took a nosedive uh, during the crisis. 
This is commercial and industrial. Uh, this is total loans and leases. And this is real estate. They all slow down or decline during the crisis. Then slowly the total recovers. But that still leaves a question whether it could have uh, recovered or increased more after the crisis than happened in fact, and that is whether the new interest on reserves policy had any lasting consequences that bore on the state of bank lending, general bank lending, and I believe it did for a number of reasons. First of all, though, let's look at uh, what's happening in bank portfolios. Here you can see what's happening to excess reserves as a percentage now, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, as a, a total excess reserve holdings. Here you can see total deposits of banks, and here you can see loans. So just by looking at the portfolios, what we see is a more or less permanent change from a situation where all kinds of bank loans add up to almost 100% of, of bank uh, deposits. Right? So most deposits are used to fund loans and leases. A very small proportion is kept as excess reserves to a situation where roughly 20% of deposits are uh, uh, represented by uh, reserves on the asset side of bank's balance sheet, and only 80% of those assets are loans. And uh, my explanation for this, which I think is parsimonious, is Reserves have gotten more attractive than loans. So as a matter of simple balance sheet arithmetic, banks are making this substitution because, as we've argued already, they aren't forced to hold so many excess reserves. They are forced to hold a lot of reserves, but not to maintain these ratios of excess reserves to deposits. They have a choice. They are presumably making choices by optimizing across assets at the margin until the returns, marginal returns, are all the same, that is, all equal to the return on cash, allowing for differences in risk and maturity and so on of different assets. And now it might, uh, the, the, to claim that interest on reserves had an effect on bank lending strikes many people as crazy, particularly when you're referring to an interest rate on reserves of only 25 basis points and when banks' net interest margins were typically well above. So the net interest margin is what banks can earn, uh, uh, is the difference between what banks earn from loans and what they are paying on deposits. The rates on deposits are very low during this time, so we can almost treat the net interest margin as an average return, nominal return on loans. And as you can see, a couple things are true. First of all, Net interest margins for all U.S. banks, they range around 3 to between 3 and 3.5 percent for most of this period. That's way more than 25 basis points. Second, now it gets a little better if we look at the banks that held a lot of reserves. Here's the Euro area banks and here's the New York banks, which I'm using as a proxy for the uh, big banks. And those are more like 1 to 2 percent. That's still a lot more than 0.25, which is what reserves earn. But, there, but wait a minute. You have to adjust for a lot of things. Risk, for example. If you adjust for risk, on a loan, a typical loan loss adjustment could be uh, 1%. During the crisis, it was as much as 5%. Here we see some average, uh, or sorry, as much as uh, uh, almost 4%. Here you see the loan loss reserves of U.S. banks. So this is a percentage that you roughly have to subtract from those other figures. And you can already see how now loans adjusting for risk, for average risk, we're getting pretty close to the net interest margin, I mean to the IOER rate. Loans are also very costly to administer. There are a lot of non-interest expenses associated with making loans. Not just overhead, but ongoing balance sheet and other expenses. Those are expenses that are not part of earning interest on the Fed's balance sheet. Okay. If you adjust for those other costs, you have a, you're further into IOER territory, you're closer. Finally, remember, these interest margins we started with are averages. 
here, I just used 2.5, or, or sorry, this is the interest rate on reserves. This is the, mar the loan demand schedule, right? This is the initial equilibrium, right? And look, this could be the average return on loans. It could be much higher. But if you're comparing the marginal loan, then it's much easier to see how it could not be attractive compared to the uh, interest on reserves. Okay, I'm going to speed ahead a little bit. Um, anyway, this is all happening in the middle of a crisis and a re recession, and the recession is getting worse and worse. Quantitative easing is supposed to uh, uh, be helping, but it's just causing reserves to pile up. Fed officials came up with theories of how that would still somehow help to end the, recover, end the recession, consisting of appeals to portfolio, balance effects, whatever. Suffice to say that even Bernanke himself said, well, quantitative easing works in theory, in, doesn't work in theory, but works in practice. In fact, it's very hard to make those theories go through. And as for working in practice, the more empirical studies we get, the more doubtful it's becoming that it had any effect. A lot of the early studies were naive studies that just looked at certain interest rate effects but didn't ask whether it was helping the economy grow. You try to look for that result, you don't find it. And the interest rate results themselves have been questioned. So here's the IOER, there's real GDP. So you can see this policy is coming in just on time to make the depression very, very serious. All right. Here is uh, more evidence of how this changed the way monetary policy worked. Here you see, normally when you increase the quantity of total reserves uh, the mo or the monetary base, you're going to get a corresponding or even larger uh, magnitude. Well, you're going to get a corresponding proportional magnitude change in broader money measures like M2. But look what's happening here. Nothing. M2 rises only by exactly the amount of the reserves created and nothing more, which is just what you'd expect if banks are hoarding everything they can get their hands on. Here's the money multiplier. You can see it collapsing. I'm going to switch ahead. I'm going to switch ahead to some of the non-macro consequences of this. I've emphasized how interest on reserves put the, as it were, the Fed's uh, operating system in neutral made it impossible for the Fed to stimulate the economy when it really needed it, and indeed uh, uh, resulted in the main consequence of all its QE operations simply being that now banks hold a lot of reserves and make fewer loans. Uh, this has had serious consequences for the use and allocation of funds in the economy. As the Fed's credit footprint has enlarged with this expansion of its balance sheet, uh, so too has the proportion of the public savings that are being administered or intermediated through it rather than through commercial banks. This chart shows the change in the Fed's share as, as QE progresses. Now, the Fed is not in the business of using savings productively. It has many desirable constraints placed on how it can invest funds. And it doesn't make ordinary commercial or consumer loans or real estate loans. So, if you think that those kinds of loans are often the most productive uses of funds, and commercial banks presumably uh, apply them that way for profit, but productivity and profit are correlated, then you have to believe that this increase in the Fed's footprint is a big detractor from the Federal Reserve's, uh, 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 from the economic productivity and growth, and a further drag on the economy. Uh, uh, another consequence is, remember that separation of the size of the Fed's balance sheet from the monetary policy stance. In the old days, if the Fed had pressure put on it by the Treasury, do monetize this, monetize that, or similar pressure from other interest groups, buy our bonds, lend to us, it could always say, look, we can't support these uh, fiscal programs because we'll expand our balance sheet and miss our inflation target. The balance sheet size is no longer a determinant of the inflation rate. Think about what that means from a public choice or political economy point of view. It becomes a loose parameter, a football to be tossed around by special interests. What is the determinant of the size of the Fed's balance sheet? Under this policy, who decides what that should be? What are the crucial indicators? 
if you can't think of the answer, you can bet that special interest groups are saying, we're going to be the indicators. Or the Treasury is going to say, we'll indicate it. So this is very, has very bad consequences. It turns the floor system into what I call a secret fiscal weapon we could do without. In an article I wrote about that, and that's what this piggy bank is supposed to represent. All right, I'm going to skip remittances. Uh, I should say that the only reason the Fed is able, you might be wondering, how can the Fed pay an interest rate on reserves higher than the rates prevailing in markets for similar assets? And the, the answer is it can do so in two ways. One is by taking on extreme duration risk, buying very long-term bonds that pay high interest rates to pay lower interest rates on reserves. That's just what it did. Any commercial bank that did that would fail the Fed's stress test. But for the Fed, it's okay, because ultimately the risk is being borne by us. What I didn't have time to talk about is how we can get out of this mess. And the important salient points there are that so far, Fed officials, for all their talk of normalization, seem quite determined to keep the floor system for reasons that have, in my opinion, nothing to do with what, what, what it takes to be a responsible monetary manage, money managing institution. One of those reasons being that they love having a big fat balance sheet and they know that a uh, floor system is a good way to have it. But it is possible to get back to a floor system by shrinking the balance sheet and then gradually getting the interest rate on reserves down below market rates. It's a bit of a juggling act. It was easier to get into than to get out of, a little bit like a Chinese finger trap. But I think it's very important. One reason I wrote this book, which includes many more arguments against the floor system and a lot more evidence about it, is to take part in or start a, really a debate about the Fed's operating system, which should be part of the debate about monetary policy going forward. And I'll stop there because Ed's getting nervous and entertain questions. Thanks very much. Please, anybody. Um, I've got a question. Yes, sir. Um, my understanding, let, let, let me introduce the question under the title, Loans Create Deposits. Yes. So if you're a bank and I'm either an individual or a corporation, you lend me money, that becomes my asset. I give you my signed loan. That's right. That, that, that's my liability, and yours is just the reverse. Yes, your so asset far. is my loan, and your liability is the money that you put into my account. That's correct. So under that kind of an idea, uh, banks are really don't need to turn to deposits as a source of funds. They, in effect, create money out of thin air. Okay, so... so I, I, I'm nodding because I'm accepting provisionally okay. what you're saying, okay. and then well, I'll explain. And, I, and, and yeah. my question was simply going to be, I mean, you know, and you can look at the Fed publication, you can certainly look at the Bank of England's yes. publications in this regard, and I was wondering how or if that idea kind of fit within your, your own thinking. Well, it, it's, it's not a bad way of looking at the surf surface of what bank lending involves, but it's a very bad way of peering below it, below the surface to, to get to the real truth. Banks do need Let's think of two kinds of deposits, first of all. The deposits that come to a bank in the ordinary course of business, people depositing their, wage, their paychecks, that sort of thing. And then there are, as you mentioned, the deposits the Fed creates incidental to its lending. So a borrower borrows 10 grand, and the immediate effect of that transaction is that the account of that borrower is credited by that amount. So, the, de yeah, so the deposits go up, but that's step one. Borrowers. Unlike those of us who maintain deposits at a bank, as it's prime, call those the primary depositors, what we want is to have uh, a cushion of spending power to draw on when necessary. Borrowers borrow from banks not to hold on to the money as a deposit. They're not going to leave it there. What are they going to do? They're borrowing to spend. Yes, yeah, so say you want to buy a, a small house. Ten grand won't buy much these days, but never mind. You're going to, in pretty short order, you're going to draw those, on those funds. You're going to write, let's say, a check to somebody who is selling the house. 
And that check is going to be presented uh, for, it's ultimately going to be deposited, chances are, at some other bank. And it doesn't matter if some checks come back to the same bank. That's an incidental okay. possibility we can ignore. So that, so let's assume all other things are equal, right? So I had just the amount of reserves I wanted before. My volume of lending was such that I was an equal. But now we're going to do just this one extra transaction. That means that other things equal, uh, when I settle with that bank, I'm now going to have an extra reserve debit of 10 I need to either have them in the first place or I'm going to need to get them. Exactly. And that means that, that, that uh, the, the, the corresponding implication of that is when banks make loans, other things equal, they really are lending away reserves. It's not that the borrowers want reserves as they do on the Fed funds market, right? The borrower really wants a house, the borrower wants a car, the borrower wants a machine. But when I make the loan, the long run result of that transaction is uh, that the deposit is credited to the borrower's account. They go back down, perhaps to zero, and reserves on the other side of my balance go down by the amount of the loan. And I end up in equilibrium without the reserves. And this is really important because I had argued earlier that normally when banks have more reserves collectively than they need, they will build up total deposits to the point where they have no excess reserves. But to do that, the reason that happens is because every bank is disposing of its reserves through this process of lending I just described. Other banks that then find themselves with excess reserves, as they will if the, they are talking about a fresh increment into, of reserves into a system that already had what it wanted, they'll pass the reserves on like a hot potato by lending them. This process will go on until total deposits in the system do increase by a multiple of the new injection of reserves, because somebody ends up holding the hot potato. Yeah, yeah, but th there is, in effect, I question the idea of the word hot potato, because okay. if loans create deposits, then then you, there is you, if there is really no excess incentive to have a hot potato to begin. With. Well, but what makes me want to make the loan? is that the excess reserves are a hot potato that's costing me uh, in potential interest. So I, I want to pass that hot potato on. I do so by making a loan to, who, to you or to anyone else. And I know if I am aware, conscious of the long run consequences of this, that that's gonna get rid of these pesky reserves on from my balance sheet and it's gonna give me a loan that earns nice interest instead of those zero interest earning reserves. So the long run operation is getting rid of unwanted excess reserves that earn no interest and replacing them with a loan that does earn interest. And it's a sense of the, the non-interest bearing reserves themselves not being the, an ultimately desired asset by the bank that makes them a, me call them a hot potato in this story. Does that, does that, so it's not that banks uh, don't like deposits, but they don't really like excess reserves when they earn no interest. Yeah, but, but they also don't need deposits. But well, they do, they no. do, no, they do, because ultimately, ultimately, right, I just gave you a story, well, the story here is one where I make a loan and I lose reserves. The point is, let's start, let's assume I'm a brand new bank and I've got to get started. Now, I can't, yeah, I, well, I don't, I start business now, I can't lend a nickel. I have to attract reserves to be in a position to make any loans, and in fact, I'm limited to making loans equal to the reserves I attract minus the reserve requ reserves required to back those deposits. So this is a sense in which private commercial banks are true intermediaries. They don't create money out of thin air in the way that a central bank can do it. They have to have resources to lend. Yeah, they need a backing. They need, I, I don't want to take yeah. Anymore. Well, but a central bank creates reserves and it can create all it wants, it can create trillions. It doesn't have to worry about running out. It's creating the ultimate reserve medium itself. No bank is in a position to create settlement media to pay other banks what it owes them. That's a crucial difference. Thank you. Yes? Are we seeing a response recently? They raised uh, the interest paid on excess reserves. Are, are we seeing a response in uh, the inflation rate, in the real growth rate, in the, the level or rate of lending? We saw early on 
there was a level effect and possibly growth effect in lending, for example. But are we seeing a relationship between those macro variables and a change in the rate hit on excess reserves? Well, first of all, let's understand. Other things equal, raising the interest rate on excess reserves, which is what the Fed's been doing every now and then for the last few years, is a tightening measure, other things equal. So if it had any, if you predicted it would have any effect, it would be to uh, somewhat reduce the inflation rate, not to, re to, to reduce inflation rather than to raise inflation. Uh, but of course, uh, the irony is that the Fed's been increasing the interest rate on excess reserves during a period when, until recently at least, it regarded the inflation rate, the actual inflation rate was below what it regarded as its target of 2%. So there's a bit of an inconsistency between the Fed's persistence in raising the IOER rate on the one hand and the fact of an interest rate below its, the Fed's target on the other, and it's kind of perplexing. The best explanation for, for it is that although the Fed has a 2% inflation target, it also has this view of policy normalization. There's nothing normal about the Fed's policy normalization uh, notions. The one thing, the one of those notions is a normal federal funds rate is about 3%. Therefore, to normalize, we've got to get the funds rate up to 3%. And, and this is where things get really crazy, right? right. The sensible way to do that is to keep money easy so that inflation rates go up and that gets you back, that alone will raise the long run federal funds, will raise all rates in the economy uh, uh, and achieve the Fed's inflation target. But instead, they're trying to get there by raising the policy rate, which is tightening, which is counterproductive. Recently, despite this, inflation numbers have finally gone up to where the Fed, and this, none of what I'm saying, by the way, is an endorsement of the Fed's inflation target of 2%. I'm just criticizing I'm just pointing to the inconsistencies between the Fed's stated goals and the means it's been using, uh, supposedly, to, to reach them. If we have time for maybe one more question. Yes, sir. Well, Correct. Know, uh, sorry. Excuse me about reform there at the end and, and how now the, the size of the reserves can be used for different special interest type uh, uh, phenomena. And so one of those I wonder is, do you view that as being a mechanism by where uh, the government's budget deficits are being monetized? And if so, does part of the reform involve getting uh, fiscal expenditures under control before we can, uh, before we can correct such a policy? You know, I don't think the, I don't need, think the government needs to have uh, any of its um, debt uh, monetized. It could easily market the debts marketing now. There's a crying, uh, there's a actual, there are complaints about shortages of treasury securities in the private market, and the private market would happily absorb a lot of these securities that the Fed is presently holding on its balance sheet. So uh, I don't think there's any case to be made that the Fed has to maintain this fat balance sheet and hold on to the treasuries it's got because the treasury couldn't afford to have it do otherwise. I don't think that's true, but Walker has something to add. Follow on, on that. Uh, the higher the interest on excess reserves that the Fed pays, the less is the Fed's rebate to the Treasury at the end of the year on its profit because the more excess reserves uh, interest it's paying out, uh, the less will be that profit. So if you added everything up, I think George is right that in, in the market, in the long run, the Treasury is probably neutral about do yes. we really want the Fed out there buying in the quantity it buys every day? Yeah. Uh, I think they would say, frankly, no. we don't care. And, and what the Fed's been doing is, up till, uh, for a little while, it was earning uh, a lot of interest compared to what it was paying out to the banks, but because it was uh, engaging in uh, taking on a lot of duration risk. But as the interest rates have risen in the economy, it's had to take capital losses on those long-term treasuries that bought. And now all those payments are, are going to go way, way down. So uh, otherwise, if it paid, if the Fed only paid interest on reserves equal to what it earned on the 
assets it acquired by attracting and uh, increasing the demand for excess reserves, it would be a wash. The, uh, the difference would be the loss of interest to the Treasury on the interest paid on the required reserves. That would be the net loss. But with playing the games it's playing now, it could make the Treasury worse, much worse off. Couldn't one interpret this entire scheme as just a profit restoration program for the banks? A big part of it was. Certainly when the, when the banks were uh, uh, being rescued, that was clear enough. Uh, the, it, is, it is a very cozy deal for the banks that find holding reserves attractive, which is really a subset of banks, these huge New York banks and those foreign banks. For other banks, it's not that uh, it's not Rex doing them any great favors. In fact, on the whole, what this set of programs has done uh, is to compress the yield turn curve, and it's now in danger of re inverting it. And most banks have real trouble earning money when long-term rates are below short-term rates. So it's actually murder on most banks. Uh, but obviously, some banks are, are, are finding it just easy money to sit on those reserves. But I think if we think of the banking system as a whole, it's very bad. It's very bad. Please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you all very much. If I may just have 55 seconds of your time, I want to thank George for being here. It's really an honor to have a monetary economist of your stature here. Thank you. I had the opportunity to meet George here in the 2000s, and uh, I had been reading his work for ages, and it was just a great opportunity to meet him. Uh, for the past week, we've had a lot of young kids, graduate students, uh, here with the uh, Harwood Graduate Colloquium and sound, focusing on sound money to be able to study under greats like George Selgin and uh, Will Luther and many others. So I just want to uh, thank all the participants, and I want to thank all of our special guests and our supporters who have made all of this possible. And I would like to invite everybody here to, if you would like, to join us for dinner and a reception. Thank you very much. Thank you.